Welcome back to this uncertainty quantification and deep learning series. In this video we want to have a look at how we can adjust a neural network to give us an estimate on the aleatoric uncertainty in the data. And of course we need a data set so I decided to create a simple regression data set with one single feature. And the special part about this data set is that the variance in this middle part is much higher than the variance at the end or beginning of this data range. And so we expect the model to give us a higher uncertainty estimate for this area and a lower one for the beginning and end. And I created this data set with some math operations. So there's a sine function and I experimented with some formulas, but there's probably an easier way to define this data set. And then I've done the same for the train, uh, sorry, for the test data set. And there I define this function on a different range, which makes the output look slightly different. But the important part for me was that this data set is defined from minus seven to plus seven, and this one from minus 10 to plus 10. And later we would expect a high uncertainty in this area because the model has never seen data from this range. And we will see that this is not possible with aleatoric uncertainty. So in order to use this data set, we need to put it into a tensor data set so that PyTorch can read it. And for this, we convert our data to tensors and then load everything into a data loader. And now we can already have a look at the first model, which is a simple regression model that predicts the mean and variance. And this model will be optimized with the maximum likelihood approach which is actually also standard. So if you only have a model with a single output, it's effectively also maximum likelihood estimation. But the difference is that we estimate more parameters here. One immediate question I had is, do you output the standard deviation or the variance? And this actually depends on how you define your loss function. So for the following, we will output variance. So we have two outputs for our model, which is mu, so the mean and variance. And for this, we define a very simple model that has two linear layers with some hidden units. And then you have two separate linear outputs. Of course, you could also put that into one linear layer with an output dimension of two, but I did it separately here. Now, one thing you need to consider is that mu can basically take any value. So negative, also positive, but variance is only defined for positive values. And for that, you need to apply some activation so that you only get positive values. And commonly, this is done using the exponential function. And then we output both the mu and variance. And that's basically already it. And this model is very simple. So we have around 4,000 parameters as our data set is also not very big. And the structure of the network looks like this. Next, I've defined a helper function that should plot the predictions, so both the mean and standard deviation of this model. And for this, I first get the predictions. I use the square root on the variance, which gives the sigma. And with this, uh, with sigma, I can uh, define a confidence interval. So it's the mean and then the mean plus two times sigma and mean minus two times sigma. And this will give me this upper and lower bound. And statistically, this refers to the 95% confidence interval. You can check this article for more details. And then I define some data frames here that hold the predictions and the X values. And in the end, I use the Seaborn line plots to plot everything. We will see how this looks like in a second. Now let's have a look at the final part. We need the loss function. And we are lucky because there's already an implementation of the Gaussian negative log likelihood. And um, this loss function can be used for exactly what we try to do. A neural network predicts a mean and variance, and we want to find out how likely a given Y value, so the regression target is given our parameters. This loss function is defined by this formula, which is nothing else but the mean so the predicted mean of the distribution minus the regression target and everything squared. So this section is basically the mean squared error. 
And then we have that divided by the variance and we have this additional term that penalizes two large variances. And I've shown this formula in the previous video already and this is just the PyTorch implementation of it. In case you wonder what the standard NLL loss does, the difference is this one is just defined for classification problems and this one is defined for continuous regression problems. By the way, I've also seen an approach where you define a Gaussian distribution with your predicted parameters and then sample from this distribution. I don't know how good it works, but then you can use the mean squared error and use that as a loss function. Okay, then we define this loss function, we define an optimizer, and we have this very simple train loop here. We iterate over the train loader and every 10 epochs we iterate over the test loader to also get a test loss. And then we lock everything here and make a plot. And the final plot looks more or less like this. And the data points that are printed here are the test distribution. And this confidence band is based on the train data. And the, the interesting part now is I've highlighted these two vertical bars that define the start and end of the train range. And outside of here, we would expect a very high uncertainty because the model has never seen data here. But as you can see, the model seems to be very confident and that shows that we cannot really rely on the predictions in that area. But what the model is able to do is to give us for our known training range a confidence score that tells us, okay, in this middle section, I'm not very sure because there seems to be a lot of noise in the data, but in this area, I'm pretty sure that the prediction has that value. Another thing I found here is that if you train too long, the model seems to overfit the confidence metrics. So the loss is decreasing the whole time for the training, but the test loss decreases only a couple of epochs um, and until here, that's the lowest point, and then it starts to increase again. And that shows that the model overfits on the train data. But as you can see, this first approach shows that it's pretty straightforward to estimate the variance in the data with a neural network. Now let's have a look at the second method, which is the mixture density model. And this one is actually pretty similar. The only difference is that we now have several Gaussian distributions that we want to predict. And another thing I want to mention here is that in our case, it might not make a lot of sense to use a mixture density network because we know that our target variable, so the variance of our target variable is Gaussian distributed. And because of that, there is no need to use a mixture of Gaussians because we can simply model that with a single Gaussian. But in case you have a more complex variance, it might be useful to use this model. In any case, we can predict three things here. And again, I did it separately again, but you can also do this in one pass. So having a single linear layer that is three times three basically, so nine outputs, but I have three outputs with three values each. So that means three mu's, three sigma's and three alpha's. And then I pass everything through the first two linear layers, which are shared. And then I have separate mu's, sigma's and alpha's. And as I mentioned before, if you use standard deviation or variance, depends on what your loss function expects. And in this example, we expect a sigma. So the loss function we will see in a second is defined with sigma. And because of that, we output a sigma. But nevertheless, sigma needs to be positive, And therefore we apply just like before an exponential function on the outputs. And the third outputs are these alphas that define the mixture. So how the different Gaussian distributions are mixed and so that the coefficients sum up to one, we apply softmax here. I've also seen some other approaches that use variants of softmax, such as Gumbel softmax, that lead to a sharper distribution. I found this to work well in this example. 
Then just like before, I have a helper function that plots everything and I take the model outputs and use them to define a thing called mixture same family. And I found this in a blog post that is linked here. Um, basically, we know we have a mixture of Gaussians and for that there is a, is a class available in PyTorch. And here you can define the mixture coefficients as well as which kind of distribution you have and how each of these distributions is defined. So you can use all the parameters, the model outputs and define a mixture probability distribution. And on this mixture distribution, you can access the mean and variance and use them to plot the confidence intervals. And in addition to that, I also plot the means of the individual distributions. So we will see this in a second. And the loss function eventually is exactly that. We define this mixture and use a function called logprop, which gives us the log likelihood of observing specific y values. And then we can just take the mean of all of the likelihoods from these y values and use that as a loss function for a specific batch. Now, just like before, we have the same train and test loop, and now we predict the outputs. So at first, all of the predictions are quite similar and we don't get a very good estimate. And then we see that these three lines, so there's a blue one, orange and green, those are the means of the individual Gaussians. And we have three of those. And the blue thick line in the middle is the mixture mean. And this is defined as a mixture of these three means. And we can see that uh, the different means have different shapes, but the mixture is getting better and better. And eventually in the end, it looks like this. And this is again, an estimate of the aleatoric uncertainty in the data, which of course only works within the train range. And with that, we can have a look at the third model, which is a quantile regression network. I've again got some details for the implementation from this link. And the use case when you want to use a quantile regression is when you don't know how the target variable is distributed. And when you also just want to estimate some quantiles. For this, we can use the quantile loss function or the pinball loss. And the model again is very simple. We have two fully connected layers and then we have three outputs one for the lower quantile, the median, and the upper quantile. And here the values can be unrestricted, so positive and negative. Just like before, I print with a helper function that prints the predictions in the middle, which is the median, the lower bound, and the upper bound. And the rest is just the same as before. And now let's have a look at the loss function. So as said before, we use the pinball loss and for that we have to define some quantiles and we can use or define these quantiles directly in the loss function. For example, we want to estimate the median and the 0 0.05 and 0 0.95 quantiles and the loss function is pretty straightforward. We simply iterate over each of these quantiles and then we have this section that basically defines this if else block in the loss. So either we use Q minus one times errors or Q times errors. And this eventually is the loss for a specific quantile. And just like before, we have this train and test loop. And the results of this look like this. And the nice part is that we don't assume anything, we just estimate the lower and upper quantile and see that this looks quite similar to the first two approaches. So this certainly gives us a very good approximation of the underlying uncertainty in the data. But again, just like before, not outside of the train range. Yeah, and that's already it for this video. And I hope that you enjoyed this. And the link for this notebook is in the description. With that, have a nice day and see you soon in the next part.